Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. Weimar Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Jacaloni, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Pittsburgh, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level Ministries in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us today. I always look forward to this. And today on Hard Questions, we're talking about denying discipline and demons. So Ooh. you're going to really enjoy what we've got to hear from the pastors today. But let's dive into this question first. Okay, number one. Why does Jesus tell us to deny ourselves? And Peter, I'm going to come to you, sure. but I want to read the verse okay. first. It says in Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So what's he talking about? Well, complete denial. He, uh, again, look at every one of the disciples he called. When he called them, they immediately left their families. They immediately left the Father. They immediately left their servants and followed Christ. Today we're preaching a salvation with no cross. And, and, I, and I have problems with that, Tom, truly, because there's a cup to drink from, and that's a cup, you know, we can't drink of the, the devil's cup and the Lord's cup, so there's a demand, there are demands on our life. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount alone will tell us that there's gotta be a life change in our life. Not only must there be a life change, Jesus gave 100%. Who are we to think that he's not calling us to give 100%. There are over 43 verses in the Bible that talks about self-denial. Well, let me, let me follow up real quick before okay. I go anywhere else. What do you mean we're not preaching the cross? Are, are, you, you, are you hearing that? Are you seeing places where the cross isn't being preached? Well, it's not so much the cross is not, the cross itself is not being preached. What's not being preached is that we have a cross to bear. Okay. So we have a cup to drink from, a cross to bear, and a crown to obtain. Okay. So in order to obtain that crown, there's got to be the cup and then the cross. All right. The cross of self-denial. Well, I always illustrate it like this with a story. He asked the question, why does Jesus tell us to deny ourselves?" And there's a, a legend that's told that Jesus was walking along one day and he told his disciples to pick up a, a stone. And they each picked up a stone. John picked up a big one and he turned it all to bread. And John picked up a big one. He had a big piece of bread. Peter picked up a little one, he had a little piece of bread. So months later, and I'm, I'm expediting the story, but uh, he told him to pick up a stone again. Peter went and found the biggest stone that he could find and he carried it around. And uh, they came to the Sea of Galilee and Jesus told them all to throw their stones in the lake. And Peter said, the last time we did this, you turned it into bread and I picked up a big one this time and you tell us to throw it into the lake. And Jesus looked at Peter according to the legend and said, Peter, who did you carry the stone for? Did you carry it for me or for yourself? And I think the problem is, is that oftentimes we want to carry the stone for ourselves. You know, we want to get the glory. You know, we are concerned about self. And so Jesus said, if you want to follow me, the first thing you got to do is deny yourself because our natural tendency is self and how we can carry the stone for ourselves. Well, and, and it's kind of like we're self-interested anyway. That's how we're made. But then society is kind of telling us, hey, fulfill that self, Jay. What, what do you yeah. think about this? Well, can I also answer what you mentioned, asked Pete about, yeah. like, well, we're not preaching the cross. Yeah. And I want to go a little bit deeper because a lot of the messaging today is we're preaching purpose, power, and prosperity without pain. Yeah, you okay. And so we have all these things. You can have the power of God. You can have this. But guess what? It's free. Doesn't cost you, salvation is free, but the abundant life costs you everything. Yeah. And that's the reason why we have to think about it. You have to go back to the original sin. The original sin, you'll be like gods, mm -hmm. knowing good and evil. So we did not deny ourselves, which got us kicked out of the garden. Yeah. So now we have to deny ourselves to get back into the garden. So what we're preaching, we're preaching all the promises of the garden without the power uh, or the, the power of death and resurrection to get us back in there. And yeah. what got us into uh, our problems is our flesh mm -hmm. and all those things. So Jesus like, hey, I got all this abundant life for you, but you're gonna have to be willing to take up your cross, follow me to get back in to the place of blessing that I have for your so you life. You said a really strong thing there. Salvation is free, mm -hmm. but the abundant life isn't costs free. Everything. It costs us everything. That's right, that's right. Well, because think about Denying it. Denying ourselves. Denying ourselves. So that, that's kind of the entry level. God's like, hey, you wanna be saved? Come on in. I paid the price for that. Now your foot's in the door. Now how much of this abundant life you obtain, it's gonna be determined by how, much, how well you mature 
which leads us to denial of self. And I want to go to Pastor Mark, but one thing I thought of when I, I considered this question was where Jesus, it says Je Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, emptied himself. He himself denied uh, right. his, uh, right. uh, you know, that nature to become like us. Pastor Mark. That was excellent. And to me, there's a difference between a convert and a disciple. Mm. And a lot of Amen. Christians pray a prayer, they receive Christ, and then they live their life. Mm. But when you become a disciple, that's different. You're giving your life to the Lord. You're laying down anything that is your will to say, not my will, but your will be done. And I do love a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he said this, when Christ calls a man, and we could say a man or a woman, he bids him come and die. <laughs> And we don't hear a lot about that. I'm not talking about dying physically, right. but dying to our yeah. will, our yeah. ways, and the flesh. Yeah. Great quote. Remember yeah. what the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. the bottom line. For me to, so that means there's daily denials of this flesh that must take so place. So it's not a denial. I just want to it clarify that. It's a, but it's not a denial of like, oh, I'm going to deny myself food or water or something just to prove how holy I am. It's, it's, it's to deny yourself is to let your desires by the wayside exactly. pick up Christ's but, but desires. Sometimes it does include food. Sure. And when you're fasting, sure. it is. Yeah. You know. And Tom, I also think this real quickly, just that it's identifying, and I don't think we have a good understanding of this. Can we identify when our flesh is present? All food, all drink, all television isn't always flesh. But there are times that when that flesh is trying to dominate us right. yes. and take control, we have to be able to identify it and crucify it. Got to be able to deny ourselves. Okay, well, let's, let's go on to the next one. And this will be interesting to hear where we go with this one. Can a believer be possessed by a demon? Pastor Glaze. Well, I, I, I would uh, begin by saying no. And I have three reasons why a, a, a believer cannot be possessed by a demon. Number one is because the Holy Spirit permanently resides in us. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you know, Paul said, what? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost. So he lives in us. And if the Holy Ghost is living in us, then, and, and he's living in us permanently, then there's no room for a demon to come in. Secondly, uh, John said, greater is he that's in you mm -hmm. than he that's in the world. So the Holy Spirit resides in us and he can overpower any demon that would want to come against us. Uh, demons can, you know, uh, afflict us certain ways, but they can't possess us. And then the third reason that I say that we can is because a lot of times in the New Testament, it tells believers to put on the armor of God, to resist the devil and to uh, look out for the devil. But nowhere does it say in the believer to cast out a devil. Well, that's interesting. I, I like that. Pastor Jay, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, uh, I think the reason why this question a lot of times gets raised is because we have to clarify the definition of what is a believer. Because the reality is, I think a lot of people that are battling with these heavy demons aren't saved, but we're calling them believers. Mm. Why are we so, calling them believers? Because I, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I believe a lot of times we, we make it too easy. And what I mean by that is this, uh, people just pray a prayer and then go live their own life. And like, what do you save from? If you're really saved, there should be a change of life. The Bible says you are a new creature. So I prayed the prayer at the altar. And the reason why I think it's so easy too, a lot of time we just say, hey, everybody bow their heads, close their eyes. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, raise up your hand if you don't want to go to hell. Now there's no acknowledgement of their sin. There's no acknowledgement of their transgression. There's no acknowledgement of their uh, uh, rebellion against God. There's no acknowledgement understanding my need for Christ. It's just, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. And, and so what happens is that I think a lot of times people are praying this false prayer, just praying the prayer and we're saying they're saved and then they go right back, sleep with their person that they're with, go back to going to the club the same night. You're not saved. It's just, it's clear that you are not. So I think a lot of times people say, well, how come they're battling with so many devils? Are they really saved? Has that salvation really taken root in their lives? Are they a new creature? Because to Dr. Glaze's point, if they are, you can't be full of God and devil and he's in there kind of saying, well, I guess both of us up in here because <laughs> think about possession means ownership. You can't be owned by God and Satan. But I do believe a believer can, if they are really saved, if they are not crucifying their flesh, the devil can bring some oppression yeah. and Amen. give them a struggle Amen. in their life. Uh, yeah. like, like we were talking about denying yourself. If they're not there, Pastor Mark. Absolutely. What is possession? It is being taken over spirit, soul, and body. That cannot happen for the believer because the Holy Spirit lives within us. But Acts 10, 38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So I do believe the believers can be oppressed, but that is not in your spirit. And the good news is we have authority That's over right. it in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Right. Very Years good. Years ago, there was that book out, uh, Pigs in the Parlor, that, that said that demon, uh, Christians can be demon possessed. One day I was with David Duplassé, and I turned to him. This was back in the 70s. And I said, Brother Duplassé, can a believer be uh, demon possessed? And he leaned over. I'll never forget. He leaned over and said to me, son, my Bible teaches me that the, that the blood of a lamb kept the death angel away from every one of the Israel, children of Israel. He says, if the blood of a lamb could do that, how much more the blood of Christ who has stained the doorpost of my heart. We are blood bought. We are blood washed. And that blood still prevails over every demonic power. Oh, that's some good yeah. preaching right there. Amen. I like that. Amen. That's great. Thank you for the question. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we ask, how does God discipline us? Stay tuned. Well, we're so glad you've joined us here on Hard Questions and we uh, just love to take on these questions, have the pastors answer them. We've got a new one coming up here. How does God discipline us? So we've talked a lot, we've had a rough morning here. We've talked about whether we're <laughs> saved or not, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> denying ourselves. Now we're going to get disciplined, so help us yeah. out here. Well, you know, I think uh, it, it, there's a lot to this. We were just talking right beforehand about uh, how broad of this, because I think discipline deals with levels. For one, you know, there's times when God will discipline you. Maybe you had a little hiccup and you did something wrong and God will deal with you. And uh, just to let you know, he's correcting you. So, I mean, like sometimes it could just be a conviction in your heart. Mm -hmm. And I always believe this, even with my own children, when my wife and I were talking about how do we want to discipline our kids? There's many different methods. I said, I want to apply the least amount of pressure to bring about the greatest result. Okay. That's the purpose of me a discipline. It's not payment. So it's not you sinned, so now I'm gonna make you pay because Jesus paid for your sin. So the difference between us and a believer is that a believer, when they sin, they pay a price because they sinned. For us, God chastens us. So what he wants to do is correct our behavior and show us, listen, when you do X, Y, Z, now if it could be real egregious, we've taken a look at like maybe pastors that were exposed and they didn't repent for certain sins and over time then God comes down hard with the gal because why? They didn't make the adjustment. So it could be anything. I mean, it, it, it just depends on what is it that we're doing? What's gonna bring about the, the nature change within us? How does, sometimes God can use somebody to speak a word to us. Sometimes it could be, he allows something to be exposed. Sometimes it could be, you, you, you spent all this money, he asked you not to, so now you're struggling and now you're in the, I mean, it could be a myriad What's of things. It's interesting about letting something be exposed because sometimes we think, well, the devil's at work, but that's the mercy of God many times. Trying to get you to correct it. But yeah. most of the time, if God exposes you, it's because there has been a pattern of that being spoken to and you haven't gotten it. So God's like, well, let's, you can fall on the rock and be broken or the rock can fall on you and crush your power. Both of those are the disciplines of the Lord. So it just depends on which one he's working in in your hey, life. Job, yeah. Job chapter 5, uh, 17 or 18. Blessed is the one whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Now here's some of the ways because this is what the scripture says. For he wounds. God wounds? Yeah, he does. He wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. You know, we have problems with that. Hey, listen, God, I'd rather have God discipline me. <laughs> he's, I'm listening. This. He's, listening. Yeah, yeah. he's listening, Pete. Go I said this listen. before. No, Go ahead. I Go ahead. It. I, and then allow me to have my own way and wind up in hell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he, and then it goes, from six calamities, he will rescue you. So if we look at the, just the book of Job alone, we see that God corrects the ones he loves. So yeah. if you're going through a correction time, that means he's not mad at you. He loves you. Yeah. Mark. I, I would say this, the primary way God chastens us, not the only way, but is through his word. Now, if that doesn't work, there may be some other courses of action, but Ephesians 5.26 that he may sanctify and cleanse her, that is the church, mm -hmm. by the washing of water by the word. And there are many times you can hear someone preaching or be in your devotional time and all of a sudden God begins to deal with you or challenge you. Uh, Jesus also said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. 
So I always say this, Jesus is the will of God in action. If you want to see how something was done or should be done, see the ministry of Jesus. And it's not the only way, but the primary way is God speaking to us and challenging us by his word. Well, you know, we tend to see the Old Testament and some of the things that God did to Israel. He brought nations against them, he brought Assyria and Babylon against them. And he told them it was because of their sin, you know, that because of how they had walked away from him. In the New Testament, we see things of, uh, you know, Ananias and Sapphira falling Whoa. over, lying to the Holy Spirit. So this is the same God that loves us, that gave himself yeah. for us. Sometimes it's hard to fit these, to make these things congruent. Can you help me out here, Pastor Glaze? Well, yeah, I'm going to go back and piggyback off of something that Jay said about the levels. Uh, because there's one level that he dealt with the people in Corinth on. And uh, it says uh, when they were coming to the Lord's table right. in 1 Corinthians 11, but let a man examine himself and lo set, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For whoever eats and drinks unworthily brings damnation on theirself. And then listen to this. Now this is the right. chastising yeah. of God. And for this cause, many are weak, sickly, and some of you have even been put to death. So, you know, the discipline, you know, we don't want to hear that part of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the, Jay talked about the levels. This is yeah. like, the, yeah. the, this is like the highest level that, yeah. you know, people who were, you know, in sin and God disciplined them he, with, uh, with sickness and some of them he even disciplined with death. And I've, I've seen this happen. You know, I've been a pastor, you know, since back in the uh, uh, 90s and, uh, and I've seen a lot of people that have gone home to be with the Lord and it was be di directly because I believe there was something going on in their life that they were unrepentant of. Now, are you talking about like, okay, let's say we uh, have a problem with something, say it's alcohol or something like that, and we die because of that earlier than we should have. Yeah. Is it that, or is it a clear like a judgment sometimes on the believer that he takes them home? Well, you know, I have to be careful as I say this, but I, th there was an attack on me. Uh, a serious attack. I mean, if, if, if I had the time to go into mm -hmm. you, I could tell you, man, it was an attack on me, my wife, my mm -hmm. family. And uh, it was a couple months later that this person that did it, mm -hmm. healthy person, jog, went home, went home to be with the Lord, man. So, I mean, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it happen. Yeah. Don't attack Pastor Glenn. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> Touch not my no. anointing. You gotta be careful yes. when you put your mouth on pastors. Yeah. You have to be careful. Yeah. You can't just go around, because see, that's where I think people miss it too. And to your point, Dr. Glaze, you're not touching Dr. Glaze. Mm -hmm. You're touching yeah. that mantle. Right. You're touching that office. Yeah. Even like with the President of the United States, you're not, if you, you don't say, well, I'm gonna go mess with Joe Biden. No, you don't mess with Joe Biden, because you're not messing with Joe Biden. You're messing with the presidential office and the United States will do whatever it takes to protect that office. It's the same thing with the kingdom of God. You know, you just can't go around just, I, I remember I heard a person say one time, I was counseling him years ago, and he said, I'm a touch me not. And I said, what's a touch me not? Touch not my anointed. <laughs> so you've got to realize, I mean, it doesn't mean people need to walk around in fear, but there needs to be the well, fear of the Lord above, to be careful. Uh, pastors right. aren't above being questioned either. That's I mean, right. we can't. That's right. We can't, Amen. Right. But, but, but yeah, you know, we, we don't do this lightly. Uh -uh. Don't do those kind of things lightly. Any other thoughts on this, Pete? Well, again, whom the Lord loves, that's whom he's going to correct. Yeah. So I think the, the most important thing is in that correction time is come to come to a complete submission. Okay, Father, you're taking me through something here. Matter of fact, the Bible says Jesus learned obedience through Jesus now, yeah, right. through the things he suffered. Yeah. suffered. Yeah. We don't want to talk about that. And there's a it's passage not in Revelation where someone was in sin and the scripture says God gave them space to repent. Yeah. And as you talked about, there are times where God will just give us grace yeah. and space to get things right, to correct things. Mm -hmm. So he begins by speaking to us through his word or by his spirit, but then eventually if we continue to resist, if we continue to be stubborn, then greater judgment comes. Yeah. But God is so gracious and long suffering before he does that. Yeah, very good, very good discussion. Well, we're, we're gonna take a break here. When we uh, get back, a viewer asks us, if God knows all, why do we bother to pray? Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Hard Questions. Let's go right to our audio hotline call. Um, I have a question regarding praying for 
people's souls. I have a few people that I've been praying for, and I know that in the Bible it it says that our names are written in the book of life. So should we pray for people that we know are not saved? I believe that we should, and I hope God does hear our prayers. Yeah, I mean, this is a, an important question, and it, uh, I think it strikes to a, a lot of theological questions as well. Uh, Dr. Glaze, could you take us uh, I'll get this? us. I'll get us jump started. Get us jump started. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is a very, if you really think about, this is a deep question. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as praying for somebody's salvation, if they're already written in the book of life, then what's the use of prayer? You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If they're already in, they're in. If they're not in, they're not in. But as we look at the scripture, you know, she asked the question, should we pray for the souls? And I, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, where Paul was dealing with people, his own people who were lost. And he said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Mm -hmm. So even though people's name are written in the Lamb Book of Life, it was still Paul's desire and it was still his prayer that God would touch them and save their souls. That's a great verse. I love that. Pete, what's your thoughts on this? Paul, before uh, Agrippa given his testimony, he says, uh, Agrippa says, almost thou persuadest me to be saved. And, and Paul's response was, not only you, but all who are around me. So I, I, you know, and I believe that was Paul's desire, Paul's wish, Paul's prayer, that all around him would not only hear his testimony, but come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about this? Well, you know, the Bible talks about how in Revelation 3, 5, how he'll blot their name out. Um, so one of the things that I believe, I don't believe that all people are saved. So let me, let me make it right. very clear. Right. Uh, but I do believe all people are forgiven. Yeah. What do I mean by that? that? That's why the Bible says, if you notice, it doesn't say that we need to accept him as our personal Lord and Savior. It, it says that we need to receive. You know, it's all throughout the book of Acts. We need to receive the remissions of our sins. Yeah. So I believe it's almost like it's already done Prepaid. if you will cooperate with the finished work of Christ and put your faith and trust in him. It's already paid. It's not like once I believe he paid for it. Yeah, right. It's Prepaid. already paid. Yeah. You just have to go and receive it. So I think that's where I believe, yeah, we should definitely pray. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4, talking about how the God of this world has blinded mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the hearts and lives of the believers. But let me go a step further. I believe many prayers are held up in the realm of human will. And so what do I mean by that? is that there are a lot of times the reason why people aren't getting saved is because we're not doing the Great Commission. Okay. Go into all the world. Well, if we all went and preached the gospel and shared our faith, what could happen to the unbelievers? But how many people right now can honestly say, if you're watching right now, how many people said in the last year I've won somebody to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Or even went and shared my faith and gave someone an opportunity. Did you guys yeah. see on uh, the NBA a uh, guy named Jaden, um, if you get a chance, check him out, uh, Jaden Ivey. He got on and he did a press conference. He plays for the Detroit Pistons. Just came on. It's been going like viral. And he was on there. And at the end of his thing, he said, I want everybody to know that Jesus Christ is coming back. He said, I want you to know if you're not right with God, you need to get right with God right now because he's coming back. We're all going to have to receive. Now, this is an NBA player, a yeah. star that went out there and preached the gospel. What if everybody started preaching the gospel? Right, I think a lot of times we're praying for what God already gave a command to. Yeah. Go into all the world. Uh, I love that, Jay. And it's funny because just a Wednesday night we were teaching about uh, the end times and a lot of it was about the gospel you yeah. know it's not yeah. about just waiting for Jesus to show up it's like what are we doing about sharing the gospel yeah. Pastor Mark and I think there's a couple of things we can do to pray for those who are not walking with the Lord because the devil has blinded the minds of the believers I believe we have the authority to take authority over that blinder because that's the hindering force. And also Ephesians 1.18 asking God to open the eyes of their understanding so that they can see it clearly who Jesus Amen. is and really who the enemy is. And lastly, pray for the right labors because sometimes Amen. we may not be the labor or we may be the labor some, for somebody else, but there's a labor out there that God has assigned for that individual. So Lord, bring the right labor at the right time open their hearts, and I believe God honors that so that they can make a decision in the light, not in darkness. You know, I love evangelism, and I've done a lot of it, and yes. I've, done a, I've so seen a, a lot sure. of people come to the Lord mm -hmm. through going out. But you know, as I've talked to people, a lot of people tell me the way they 
came to the Lord was somebody just invited him to church. Yeah. They invited yeah. him to church. That's yeah. one of the biggest yeah. things. Is have you guys experienced that? Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of people that come to the church in, in, in our tradition, you know, we give an invitation at the end, and a lot of people come forward to join the church. Yeah. You know, but they need salvation. So yeah, a lot of and they've been invited by somebody, and so that's a great opportunity to share the gospel with. Uh, people that have been invited to church. Yeah, I, I tell you, I, I, I heard, uh, I think it was Rick Warren's church. He says that we, we let it, we make it easy for them to get saved, but make it hard for them to join the church. <laughs> they, then they have a fountain out front. They baptize people all the time, but then, then they disciple them into really understanding what it means to walk with the Lord. So uh, great, great program, great uh, answers. Thank you for the question. We like to end the program with a scripture. And today we go to Hebrews where it says this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11:6. Hey, we're diligent about so many things. Let's be diligent about seeking the Lord. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program, and we want to hear from you. Email your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org.